Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Football Manager 2018 with Zebu Nation. We're still in the beta, at least for the next couple of days. We're also still with FC Dallas in MLS. And we're trying to make our run in the Champions League. I think that would make this beta save well worth it if we could actually win the Champions League. The first time ever that I've won the Champions League. If it happens in the beta, that's outstanding. We got a couple of games left. We're in the quarterfinals, so we're going to get to those eventually. But first, we're going to talk MLS Corner. And something that we we're going to talk about here are the tactics that have helped us get this far in the Champions League, at least partially responsible. If you watched our last couple of matches in the Champions League, you noticed that we've scored a fair number of goals from set pieces, most specifically set pieces from the corner. So this episode of MLS Corner is going to be all about actual corner plays, and I'm going to show you the tactics that I use to score goals from set pieces from the corner specifically. So let's go to the tactics. Let's go up here to set pieces, down to corners, and here we are. Here is the magic formula that has been scoring a lot of these goals. And if you look at it, you're going to notice something right away. You're going to notice sort of a dearth of players here in front of the goal. And that's for two reasons. Number one, it's to get my best players in front of goal. You know, these are the players who I feel have the best abilities to score in this area. And sort of getting rid of all the other players means that there's, you know, a little less traffic in front of goal. And maybe that'll pull some defenders out. Maybe it'll just mean less of my players will be bumping into each other. So that's good. But the other thing it does is it avoids something that happened quite often in FM17. At least it happened to me. I don't know if it happened to you. Whereas you would get caught on the counterattack after set plays very, very often. It happened to me, you know, an inordinate number of times in FM17. What would happen is a ball would, would get uh, deflected out of the box. The other team would grab a hold of it, boot it downfield, and I'd only have like one or two defenders downfield, and it would be an odd man rush down the field, and I would get caught on the counterattack. It happened quite often. So this tactic is set up to avoid that problem from happening, happening to me in FM18. And the way I do that is twofold. Number one is I have a player out here in this position, which is lurk outside the area. Usually one of my midfielders because they're pretty good with the ball and their job is to sort of catch those rebounds, right? The ball goes into the box and gets headed out, usually to the same side where the corner gets kicked in from. And then they're there to grab that rebound, possess the ball, and restart your offense, you know, or start the second phase of attack, however you want to put that. So that sort of stops a lot of those counterattacks right in their tracks. And even more importantly, it gives us the ball so that we can continue our attack instead of getting counterattacked against. And then the other thing I do with this, with this uh, set play is I clear out a lot of the trash in front of, in front of the net. You know, all these guys who aren't very good at heading and they're just going to be in the way, move them out. So I have two, my two fullbacks out here, and they're... Their uh, strategy here is to just stay back. They stay back at all times. You know, they're not good at heading, but they are good at defending. You know, they've got tackling, they've got speed. They're fullbacks. That's what they're there for. So they stay back at all times. And then I've got my defensive midfielder here in this role, which is stay back if needed. And again, my fullback, uh, you know, he's he's there for marking and tackling. Not fullback, my defensive midfielder. He's there for marking and tackling. That's like pretty much the definition of, of his job. So the fact that he stays back in defense, the three of them together, they really blunt any kind of counterattacks that come off of these set pieces. So I'm very happy about that part of the strategy. Now the other part of the strategy is uh, scoring goals, right? That's what we're here for. That's what these set pieces are for, to help you score goals. So there are three key components well, I guess four key components to this uh, to this tactic. The first and foremost is having your best leapers, your biggest, strongest guys with the best heading here at the posts. 
Okay. You have one player on the near post, and his role is to attack the near post. Then you have one player on the far post, and his job is to attack the far post. Now, for me, it's my two central defenders. My two central defenders, they are my biggest, strongest guys. They've got the best leaping ability, the best heading on my team. It's probably the same way for your team, but uh, you know who's to tell? Maybe you got some outstanding wingers or strikers or who knows what. But just make make sure that's who is on either post. One man attacking the short near post, one man attacking the far post. Then the base play is that you have your your corner taker, who for me is Mauro Diaz, who's pretty good at taking these corners. 14 corners ability, that's pretty good. You have him send the ball to the near post. Right here is the command, near post. Now most default settings is uh, mixed. But then you never know where he's sending the ball. He's sending the ball all over the field. You don't want that. You want near post because you're sending it directly to your biggest, strongest guy, your guy with the best chance of winning a ball in the air. And, you know, 8 out of 10 times this isn't going to work. 8 out of 10 times the ball is going to get intercepted or your guy is going to miss kick it and send it somewhere else. But on those 2 out of 10 chances, you want your best chance of getting ahead on the ball. So that's why you put your best guy near post and you send it directly to him. You don't mess around. You say, I'm going to my best guy. So you do that, and, and what happens if he gets ahead on the ball, he usually does one of two things. Number one, he heads it on straight into goal, and that's good, and that's what you want. And you know maybe he'll be inaccurate and send it over or to the left or to the right or whatever, and maybe the goalie will make a save, and that's fine. But the other thing he usually does is, does, is he tries to head it on to the opposite post. You know, he gets a head on the ball, flicks it on to his partner over here on the far post. That's why you want all these guys over here on the far post, specifically your other central defender or your other guy who's your best at uh, heading the ball. Because they're going to get those flick ons and you're going to want them to be on the backside to head those into the po into the goal. And then you've got, you know, some extra guys in case his head goes errant. In case his, his flick on goes errant, you got a couple of other guys backing them up, and these guys are all just going forward. They're all just charging towards the goal, trying to get that rebound. Now the final part of this play is up here, the striker. And for me, I think the striker is perfect for this role because you want a guy who's got anticipation, you want a guy who's got a little bit of size and strength and you know ability to head the ball, and not every striker is going to have that, but a majority of strikers are going to have those abilities just naturally. They're going to have anticipation. They're going to have off the ball, finishing, heading, all that kind of stuff. And that's what my striker, Mar um, Max Arruti, has. He's, he's not the best at all of those things, but he at least has all of those abilities uh, in, in one way or another. So what his role is, is to attack the ball from deep. So he starts here at the semicircle just outside the box, and he just charges forward, and he attacks the ball. Not the goal, he attacks the ball, because sometimes, you know, as good as your corner taker might be, they're never 100%. They never 100% get the ball to your central defender here on the near post. There's always a chance for them to be inaccurate. And when they're inaccurate, they typically send the ball long. And when they send it long, they're sending it straight to your striker who is attacking the ball. So it makes for a good combination, and a lot of times it looks like that was your play, because it'll, you know, people will crowd around your central defender, and suddenly the ball goes whizzing over his head, and there's your striker in perfect position to score a goal. So this, you know, and if he sends it way too long, if the striker can't get to it, you still have this bunch of dudes over here on the left-hand side, the far post, and and they can catch other errant passes. So that seems to be why this works, because it's got a very good set play straight to your best aerial attacker here. But then it also has some good variations. If you miss the ball, if you're inaccurate, if you flick it on, whatever, you got other options out here to score. And that's why it seems to score goals. So if, you, if you're having trouble scoring from the set piece, scoring from corners, give this a shot. This is my little short post corner play i don't know what else to call it set piece uh i have another corner that i 
use as well. It's a little less sophisticated from the left-hand side. But still, you know, it has similar principles. You got the two guys on the on the posts, but this one sends it to the far post. Just for a little bit of uh, you know, a little bit of change up. Maybe the teams will play a lot of a lot of players on the short post and you just boot it long. And you know, this one is a little less successful, but it's still fairly successful. We still have the three players back on defense, which is key. We still have a player lurking outside the box, which is key. And then inside, we got more players sort of crowding around the box and getting forward towards the goal. So like I said, it's a little less sophisticated, but it also works. I think the key is not to just let your corner taker kick the ball anywhere, right? In this in this case, he's kicking the ball far post, kicking it again to one of your best guys in the air, your central defenders. And, uh, you know, the same sort of things can happen. He can flick it on, or he can flick it back to the other post, you know, where this guy is waiting. Or he just, if he gets ahead on it anywhere, you've got all these guys waiting to pounce on it. And so that's uh, helpful. Helps you score goals. So there you go. There is our tactics for the day. Set pieces from the corner. I've scored lots of goals on these, and maybe you can too. All right, so now we're going to move on with our series a little bit. We're getting close to the MLS uh, regular season, and we're starting to get some emails. We're starting to get some uh, interesting things happen. First of all, we had to submit our roster. So we have to register our preliminary 30 players for the roster for the new MLS season. Players who are not registered will be placed in the waiver draft. Injured players are automatically registered. Um, and we've left a couple of players unregistered, and these guys are injured, so, you know, they're on the... Uh, I put them on the injured list, so they don't count against our registration right now. It's another rule you have to remember. If you got injured guys at the beginning of the season, go ahead and put them on the injured list just to keep them off your registration and then you can register them later if you need to, or if you can't register them, you can just keep them on that list for the whole season. No problem. Keep them on your team. So the other important thing about this registration is that at any point prior to this registration, you can waive a guy from your team and their salary will not count against the salary cap. So if you don't want them, if you say, like, I don't like this guy, you can just say goodbye. Get out of here. I don't like you. And uh, they won't count against your salary cap. But after today, after this roster submission, anybody else you cut from your roster, their salary will still count against the cap. So it's very important that if you got cuts to make, you make them now or hold your peace until the next time uh, this window opens. There's another registration window that opens in the summertime for the summer transfer window, and then you can cut players again. But for now, the players go all into this uh, waiver draft. So we're going to scout these players. Click that little button to scout the players. And uh, I'm going to pause it here, and I'm going to come back for the waiver draft just so you can see it. I don't know that I'm going to pick anybody because I've already got my uh, squad set. I guess I could show you the squad, show you our registration. So here it is. We've got 27 of the 30 players registered. We've got our three designated players. We've got seven of eight internationals. So like I said in my previous videos, keep a designated international slot. Not a designated slot. If you, if you can keep a designated slot open for the summer transfer window, go ahead and do that. I don't have that luxury. But keep a foreign, an international slot available for the summer transfer window, which I've done. We got 10 off budget players. We got four reserve players instead of six. Got a salary cap of 3.4 million, or at least our salary cap number is 3.4 million, which is well below the new salary cap. The salary cap has gone up for this season. It was 3.65 last year, and now it's $4 million this year. So a significant raise in the cap from 2017 to 2018. And we're well underneath that. So we've got a lot of room. And we've got room for a reason. we got room because we have a player coming in already 
in the summer transfer window. He's an international player, so he's going to use that international slot. We got space available within the roster. 30 man. We've only got 27, but we've got two guys on injured reserve down here, Reynolds and Garza. So they would be players 28 and 29, and then our new guy coming in on the summer is number 30. So there you go. There's our numbers. And that's why I keep telling you, you got to have a plan for your roster. You got to keep these numbers in your head to say, how many guys do I got? You know, how many internationals do I have? You need to keep those numbers straight so that you don't have to get to this day and cut players that you don't want to cut, which I didn't have to do, thankfully. All right, so we're going to pause it here, come back for the waiver draft. Probably won't pick a guy in the waiver draft, but we do have a little flexibility. If we need to pick a guy, we can, because we have salary cap, we have room available. We have guys on the injured list. We could keep them on the injured list. We could send guys out on loan if we need to make room. The one thing we can't do is cut players, so we're not going to do that. All right, we'll be back momentarily. We'll see you then. Do I need to say see you then? Because I'm just going to pause and come back in a second. I don't know. doesn't matter. Let's... And we are back for the waiver draft. Take a look at this. Major League Soccer March waiver draft. So I was correct in my, my uh, postseason video where I said it was the March waiver draft. So we went through the December waiver draft way back obviously in December so now we've made our roster cuts everybody has waived their players and if you missed my previous video the reason why we have waivers is because players in MLS they sign contracts with the MLS not with their specific teams although they do in a way what happens is they sign a contract and they agree to play in MLS and then MLS gives their contract rights to whichever team that signed them, that owns those rights. So when the play team waives a player, they still have a contract with the MLS, so they have this extra chance to sign on to some other team, to, for some other team to, to be given their contract rights for free before MLS has to uh, you know, make them a, a true free agent. So let's... Uh, Take a look at this waiver draft. It consists of two rounds with only 19 players available, so not a lot of cuts this year. Uh, Dallas's first pick is the 16th overall selection, so we got quite a ways to go. It's going to be slim pickings. Uh, if a team passes, it may no longer participate in the rest of the draft. Player picked in the draft uh, will see their current contract transferred to their new club. So that's what I was talking about. Your contract is with MLS. And they just transfer your contract rights between one team and the other. That's why it's such a funky system that they don't have in other leagues around the world. So let's view the draft. Take a look at our scouting. Is there anybody of excellent ability here? Zach McMath. I think he's a guy I want. No. He's not a guy I want. 26 years old. Goalkeeper. He's not terrible. I guess he has three stars. 15 one-on-ones, 15 reflexes. You know, he's a pretty decent goalkeeper. If I needed a goalkeeper, I would pick this guy up without hesitation. To be minimum a reserve. But I don't need a goalkeeper, so I'm not going to. Uh, let's see. Anybody else of interest let's look at potential now nope. marky delgado who's this guy 22 year old american winger he's all right not worth the trouble honestly making 150,000 per year no thanks zach mcmath um let's see here's a guy devron garcia 65,000 22-year-old Honduran ball-winning midfielder. He's all right, but he's an international player. Don't need international players. So there's nobody I'm really interested in this draft, unfortunately. But this gives you an idea of the caliber of players you're looking at. And unfortunately, I haven't scouted everybody, so I don't really know exactly what all of these players are or you know how good they are. But for the most part, our team is set, and I wanted to participate in this draft just in case there was somebody who was phenomenal. 
So we're going to skip to our next pick. And we're going to pass. We're going to finish. So it's kind of anticlimactic. We didn't pick anybody. But at least if you've never seen a waiver draft before, now you know what to look for, what the players are like. This is very typical of a waiver draft. A lot of times you don't pick a player. Like you look and see uh, LAFC pass, New England pass, 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 pass. Uh, see, Seattle picked up a guy with the fourth pick. Uh, Orlando picked up a guy with the sixth pick. And then everybody else just kind of passed. So it's, uh, you know, that's what happens. It's not like the super draft where you have to sit there and hem and haw and decide, am I going to pick this guy? Am I going to pick that guy? You just quickly look down the list and see, is there anybody I want? No? Okay. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. All right, so we've got our very first MLS game of the season versus New England Revolution coming up. I'm going to show that game real quick. And uh, then we've got Pachuca coming up. Uh, we've got our team briefing here. We'll handle the briefing. Talk to the team. Um, we're going with the DM wide, whatever. Attacking. We're going attacking. Yeah, we're going attacking. Um, talk to the team. Um, mentality attacking. I don't know how much this really like gets the team fired up. But, I don't know. I do it. It seemed more important. When uh, Sports Interactive was talking about it in their videos, it seemed like it would be a more important thing. But uh, it doesn't seem to be very important at all. It's like There are a lot of weeks where I just accidentally skip it, and the team seems to play okay. I don't know. Maybe uh, Maybe it's having a more detrimental effect than I'm aware of. But maybe not. Who knows? Here we go. Match preview versus New England. Uh, let's see. Odds for the postseason. I don't really understand these odds. Are we in excellent form? So that's good. Are we the favorites? Are they the favorites? I don't know. Team selection. Let's go. Uh, I thought about playing a rotated side just because we're getting ready for Champions League. Um, we've got basically a week, though, between games. One, two, three, four days. That should be plenty of time to rest up. Maybe we'll just rest key guys, okay? We'll, we'll rest hedges. We'll rest... Hmm. We'll rest... Grezo. That's good. We'll rest Michael Barrios. We're bringing our new, our new guy. Where's our new guy at? New guy, where you at? Don't want Villarreal. There he is, Jefferson Savarino. Bring him in uh, for Villarreal. Play up here for Michael Barrios. See how he works as our reserve player. And then, of course, we're going to rest Max Arruti just in case. So our only big-time player we got in there right now is Mauro Diaz, but the rest of our team is intact and fine. So we'll submit that team, and let's go. We're, uh, you know, maybe it's a little being a little paranoid over these injuries. Proceed to match, yes. But we're trying to win the Champions League here. That's a big deal. As I said before, I've never won the Champions League, so I'm uh, I'm excited for this opportunity. I've gotten this far before. Give the fans something to cheer about. Let's get out of here. Let's get started. Let's go to the tunnel. Send the assistant. I don't want to answer these questions. New England. This is New England. It's a sad state of affairs in New England. This fan base is just not, it's not there. I don't know what it is. They used to have good fans, but recently not so much. You know, they one of their big problems was they play in a NFL football stadium. It's like, you know, 80,000, and they're just not going to fill it up. So it looks a little more sad than it is. I don't know if they've got their own stadium now. This kind of looks like an NFL stadium here, but it's hard to tell from football manager. 
But yes, yeah, sparse sparse crowds out there in New England, unfortunately. And that's something I talked about in my previous videos, where the older established teams are sort of going through this lull in attendance and in uh, in fan support. So all the fan support is coming from the newer clubs. And, uh, you know, teams are getting jealous. Here's Zamora making a run. He beats his man. See, does he get any support? Centers it. Gets a corner out of it, maybe? Nope. Defense manages to boot it downfield. So we'll see. We might start seeing the phenomenon that happens in, uh, in uh, American sports of teams leaving the city that they're, they started out in. You know, and seeking better fan support elsewhere. Doesn't happen, I don't think, in uh, in Europe very much, as far as I know. You know, you don't hear about Tottenham, like, pulling up stakes and uh, moving somewhere else. Ooh, penalty. Uloa will take the penalty. All right. I didn't even uh, see that happen. It must have been just, just inside the penalty box. So here we are. Uloa, can he get our first goal? He does calmly puts it in no pressure at all second goal of the season so they're counting our uh, Champions League goals as real goals that's good you go, can we upload this video to YouTube now all right I forgot to sign in again I, th I think you have to sign in every single time you start up the game if you want to be able to upload videos to YouTube it seems that way maybe that uh, Maybe there's a button I need to push, like, save password or something. I don't know. But here is New England trying to get on the counterattack. Bad pass. Acosta gets it upfield. Weigel. Diaz gets it up to Zamora. Back to Pomichol. Is he going to look out wide? He does. Acosta, in that attacking fullback role, sends it in towards Zamora. He heads it down to Weigel. Nice play, boys. Who says these are backups? These are MLS quality dudes. Playing well. That's textbook. That's our attacking tactic right there. You get it out wide to the fullback while the inside forward crashes in. Send it wide. Striker gets ahead on it. Back to the inside forward who scores. I mean, when a tactic works, it works. What can you say? Some people, maybe they think of a tactic just as the formation, and they don't necessarily think about how the players work together in concert to attack the other team. So sometimes you got to think about that. you got to think about not just putting a player in a position and having a weird, like, asymmetric formation, but actually use the roles as as they're programmed into the game, right? Your attacking fullback will go forward. Your inside forward will dive towards the goal. Use that use that movement to actually make make an attacking strategy. Here we go on the counterattack. Severino, our new man on the right side, the youngster sends it forward to Diaz. Diaz, Diaz, Diaz. He's our attacking midfielder, so that's that's another part of that strategy, of that tactic, is getting your advanced playmaker attacking, getting him you know, involved in plays like that. He should have scored there, but uh, at least he had the opportunity. Here we go, 29 minutes down. We're looking good. Acosta with the throw-in on the far side. Pomichol has it now to Diaz. What's he going to do with it? He's got plenty of room if he wants to take it. He drops it out wide to Hollingshead. Savarino back to Pomichol at midfield. Looks like we're getting a little conservative here, making some nice passes. Diaz forward, Savarino can't make that run. Jay Acosta on their side. There's lots of Acostas out there. I didn't, I didn't know. Our last team we played had an Acosta of their own. New England, I don't know what their strategy is. They're just booting it downfield. So here's Pomichol now. That was a bad pass. He is still... A teenager. We got to remember that he's been playing with us for a full year, but he's still a teenager. Here's New England on the attack. Now they get it out to win on the far side. He tries a cross. No good. It's stopped by the goalkeeper. And thus end the highlight. 30 minutes down. Keeping our two-nil goal or two-nil two-nil goal. 
That would be a heck of a goal. Our 2-0 advantage over New England. Let's see if we can keep this going into halftime and uh, get to half with this lead. There's nothing worse than you know having the other team score a late goal on you. Here's Aha sending it down forward. Zamora can't get to it. Kowasi gathers it in for New England on the attack. Namath, Agudelo, what a stop, what a stop. So I've been going after Agudelo. Um, this guy here, Jay Agudelo, striker. They got him transfer listed, but they don't want to talk. You know, I've, I've asked them what they want in trade, and they just say, go away. And I've, I've sent them trade offers of, you know, as much money as I can, I can send them, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars and draft picks and players, and they just say, nah, go away. They don't give me anything to work with. So I've gone in the press and said he's a target of mine, hoping that that would upset him and, and make him, make him want to come. And it seems like that has dropped his price. Because his original price that was listed on his transfer listing was $6 million, which obviously an MLS team can't pay another MLS team $6 million. Even if I have $6 million in the bank, I can't legally offer it to them. Uh, but since I started making a fuss in the press, that was a terrible pass, uh, his price tag has dropped to like $3.9 million. So I'm wondering if I can put together assets that might come close to that. You know, draft picks, allocation money, whatever I can put together that might approach, you know, a couple of million dollars. Probably not. I probably couldn't give them enough to uh, to equal three million dollars unless they count players' value. So I don't know. Maybe I'll try to offer them a better player and just see if they'll say yes. Like, I'll try to offer them, you know, Max or Rudy and see if they say yes. That would be weird. All right, so talk to the team. Um, don't get complacent. Things can turn around. All right, they're happy with that. Do we want to change the tactics? No, I don't think so. We're on the attack. We're feeling good. Maybe... Maybe we could go to control. Yeah, I think we will. I think we'll go control, retain possession. You know, just maybe we can make the second half fly by. And uh, get out of here with our victory and get ready for the Champions League. Here we go. Fagundes, that's an interesting name. Gets it forward for New England. Win has it. On the near side, his cross attempt is blocked. Weigel takes it downfield and thus ends the highlight. The clock starts ticking. 50 minutes coming up here. Weigel has it in New England territory. He gets tackled pretty violently there, but no call by the ref. And now New England starts their attack. Looks like they've started to calm down a little bit, not just booting the ball downfield. Here's Namath. I take it back. He just boots the ball downfield. And, uh, I mean, I guess that was a shot attempt in some fashion, but not not a very good one, unfortunately for them. So I don't know if I'm still working out this trade stuff or if Sports Interactive is still working out the trade stuff. But it'll be interesting if I offer them a, a really good player. Mauro Diaz has been booked... Okay, we wanted to get him out of there anyway. So, who are we going to bring in? Um, I should have brought, I should have put some of my other guys on the bench. Our only option here is Grezo. Uh, I don't want to do that. So, we'll just leave him in. Let him get booked. He's not a really violent dude, you know, all things considered. He's not uh, aggressive, and he doesn't get a ton of yellow cards, and he doesn't go crazy tackling people. He's more of a skilled, you know, offensive-type player. So I don't think I have to worry about him getting booked again. Like I could I could come back to uh, eat those words, but for now, I think he'll be okay. Their team is looking much more tired than mine. 
Wynn has a uh, injury to deal with. Here's Namath. Fagundes. Trying to get the ball downfield. Uh, Jay Acosta. How many Acostas do they got on their team? I guess that's just the same guy, just on the other side of the field. Here's Agadelo. Getting it out wide to win. Limping around. Taking the cross to Agudelo. Um. Okay. That looked like a goal. But I guess it went over the net. I mean, the ball was inside the net. You saw it. It must have went in from the opposite side. It went in from the back side. I don't know. But uh, they didn't count, so that's all that matters. 75 minutes. Clock is ticking. Now, I don't think we're going to see a lot of highlights from here on out. We're just going to sit on the ball, run out the clock, try not to get anybody injured. Pharrell into Namath for New England. Smith centers it to Kawasi, who takes a shot. Gonzalez, man, he is he has been so good. He's, he's much better than his rating. Two and a half stars. He's been so much better than that. It's Acosta with a free kick. Our version of Acosta, Kellen Acosta, sends it over the net. But yeah, I've been so happy with Gonzalez. I was a little worried that maybe he wouldn't uh, be as good as he was in FM17. In FM17, I made the switch to Gonzalez early, and he panned out very well. And it looks like it's the same way in FM18, so I'm excited about that. You're going to have a goalkeeper set for a very very long time he's only 23 years old so he's going to be in goal possibly for the next 10 years that's what you want from a goalkeeper is just that rock solid stability and there we go wow we really ran out the clock there we just took the ball and went home uh let's see tobias colner of goal.com i must admit i personally had this down to a draw Still to be proved wrong, and FC Dallas have come away with the result they will be delighted with. Absolutely. Some analysis real quick. Take a look at the heat map, and uh, much more forward. You know, normally when we do our counterattack, our heat map is like back here. But now that we're on attack, our heat map is up front. That's pretty good. Not really as far forward as I would like, but still on at least on their side of the field. Meanwhile, their heat map is just all over the joint. Down the right side, down the left side, everywhere. I don't know what they were doing. Review? No. Analysis. So you have to go analysis, then team analysis, then summary. It's too many buttons. Too many buttons. Too many buttons. Alright, what are we looking at here? Um, nine tackles, one. For Acosta. Same for Uloa. Fouls against. Boy, they fouled us a lot. Zamora had no ch overall chances, but he did have that one nice assist to Weigel, so that was good. All right, let's get out of here. This has been going on long enough. Ratings, eh, not as spectacular for a 2 0 victory, other than Uloa, 7.6 rating. Huh, all right. Oops, I forgot the team talk. Doesn't matter. So coming up next, we have Pachuca in the Champions League in the quarterfinals. So let's uh, end it here and get to that game, and we'll that'll be what we'll do for the rest of the series. I'm pretty sure that come Friday, the actual game will be out, and we can kind of end this series, hopefully with a Champions League win. But if not, um, it's definitely a good save for the beta. I really enjoyed this. And, uh, you know, a couple of more videos to go. So until then, uh, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.